Sundani. I am the director of Critical Connections, which is an organization here in the Valley that puts together events on issues related to American Muslims and other minority groups. Um, our event today is part of the Rehumanizing and Restoring Relationships series that we've put together with Karuna Center for Peacebuilding, our partners. Um, you will hear more about Karuna Center's work from Jenny McKenna, who is their board member and who will talk a little bit about what they do internationally and will also moderate the second half of this event. Um, so in keeping with our theme of rehumanizing, we thought we would put this event together um, to raise awareness around um, the human cost of American-backed wars. Um, I'm sure many of us are aware of uh, the US government's involvement in Syria, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, and other places, uh, but you might not be familiar with the fact that currently the US military is involved in 76 <coughs> different countries around the world. And in popular discourse, in public discourse, in the media, and when we hear our policymakers, we don't always have a full understanding of um, the human toll that these interventions take or the impact of these interventions on local populations, on local livelihoods, uh, local infrastructure, and in the countries in which we operate. Um, and so in order to help us get a fuller understanding of that, the, you know, the, the human dimension of our interventions, to understand how we can um, assess the exact impact that we have on those populations, um, and to give us a sense of what our obligations as citizens are when our military and our government um, sort of uh, uh, commits uh, inadvertently, but um, civilian casualties in our name. So in order to do that, we have invited um, Dr. John Terman, who is a foremost expert uh, in, uh, on this subject. And he has joined us um, from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and we are very grateful that he is here. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. Terman. Uh, before I introduce him, I'd just like to give you a quick sense of how our event is going to unfold. For the next 30 or 40 minutes, I'm going to ask Dr. Terman a series of questions about the subject. And then, um, because we're a small group, we'll just sort of break up into uh, small groups for a very small period of time, for about 10 minutes, and turn to our neighbor, and. That part, Jenny McKenna is going to moderate, and then we'll reconvene as a large group and have a Q&A session with our um, speaker. So, uh, by way of his bio, Dr. Terman is the executive director and a principal research scientist at MIT's Center for International Studies. He is author or co-author and editor of 14 books on international affairs, including, most recently, Dream Chasers, Immigration and the American Backlash. I just got my copy and I can't wait to read it. Uh, he's also the author of The Death of Others, The Fate of Civilians in America's Wars, Oxford University Press, 2011. Earlier work includes The Fallacy of Star Wars, The First Important Critique of Strategic Defense, and Spoils of War, The Human Cost of America's Arms Trade. This was published in 1997. In addition, he has published more than 100 articles in periodicals such as The Nation, Boston Globe, The New York Times, Washington Post, Esquire, Wall Street Journal, and Boston Review. Before coming to MIT in 2004, he was program director of the Social Science Research Council from 1986 to 1999. Dr. Terman was executive director of the Winston Foundation for World Peace a leading funder of work to prevent nuclear war and promote nonviolent resolution of conflict. In 1999-2000, he was Fulbright Senior Scholar in Cyprus and produced an educational website on the conflict. He has been a trustee of International Alert, Mother Jones Magazine, the Institute for War and Peace Reporting, and the Center for Contemporary Art at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Dr. Chairman, thank you so much for being here. So um, I'll start with the first question, Dr. Yemen. In your writings, and you, as I mentioned, you've published a lot, you have often discussed this notion um, that when we talk about military interventions or US military interventions abroad, um, analysts and policymakers um, sometimes tend to overlook the human cost of these interventions. Can you give us a sense of exactly what the human cost of war is and give recent examples of where we might have overlooked these? 
yes, that's a big question, but I, um, I'll focus on one, which is Iraq, um, the Iraq war that began in 2003. Um, it's really what stimulated my interest in the human cost of war uh, more than anything else, which was uh, as the United States was invading Iraq and uh, eventually reaching Baghdad and, and overthrowing the Saddam Hussein regime, uh, I noticed that there was virtually no reporting on what was happening to Iraqi civilians. Um, clearly, uh, there was a lot of killing going on, uh, a lot of killing of Iraqi um, military forces. Uh, even that was a little sketchy. The, the reporting was um, incomplete and confusing to some extent. But I was particularly interested in the civilian toll, and virtually no one was covering this. The news media wasn't covering it particularly well. And as time went by, um, this became even more acute. That is, that there was less and less attention to um, to the cost to Iraqis as the Sunni resistance began to grow. You remember it became rather prominent during the summer after the April invasion. So, um, about a year later, uh, these epidemiologists at Johns Hopkins University published the first uh, article, first study they did of civilian uh, mortality uh, in the British medical journal, The Lancet. And it was, a, it was rather controversial because they claimed that uh, 96,000 Iraqis, <coughs> not just civilians, but all, any Iraqi, um, fighter or non-fighter, um, had died in the conflict in the first 18 months or so. And the way that they came about this was, um, how they came, arrived at this number was through a, a method that's widely used by epidemiologists, that's a household survey or a population survey. And it's like doing, uh, it's similar to doing like a presidential poll in the United States. That is, you, you have a sample, you have a census, you have uh, randomized um, uh, questions being asked of, of the population, uh, and then you um, use that as for an estimate for the whole country. Uh, there's some problems with the method, which I can go into later if, you, if, if you're interested. But generally speaking, it is widely accepted in epidemiology, um, where it's mainly used to get a handle on uh, a prevalence of disease in a particular place. Uh, they use it now for mortality, and that's how they came up with this number. And it's probably the best way to estimate mortality during a war. There's really no other way that's satisfactory. There have been other attempts, Iraq body count and others uh, have, have sort of accumulated evidence from morgues and from news media reports and so on, but there are a lot of problems with that method as well, much, much more serious problems with that method. So in any case, we had this, this number of 100,000, and it was generally discarded in the news media and by politicians um, as being too hot and mm -hmm. unbelievable, uh, which I didn't find unbelievable at all. In 18 months of war, right, in a country of 30 million, it's not, not a particularly high number, unfortunately. I mean, if you look at other wars, Vietnam, Korea, uh, even smaller wars like East Timor, the mortality rate as a, popul as a percentage of the population was much, much higher. Excuse me. Um, in any case, I thought it would be a good idea to do another survey, a larger survey, um, that is more households, better, a little bit better control over the randomization process and so on. Um, not least because, uh, like in any, 
sort of scientific endeavor, if you can repeat an experiment, if you can repeat a method, you get approximately the same results and you know you're on the right track. So we did that. Mm -hmm. I raised some money for it and, and commissioned them to do it. They did, same, basically the same team did the, did the survey again. And this time, in the, by the middle of 2006, they estimated there were 600,000 Iraqis who had been killed. Since that time, um, there have been uh, two other uh, household surveys, and they came up with smaller numbers, but still in the same range, about uh, four to five hundred thousand, which was much more than what was being spoken of at the time. I mean, at the, when the first um, survey that I was involved in, the 600,000 one was, was publicized. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked George Bush, uh, this was in October of 2006, someone asked Bush if he thought um, what he made of that number. And, and he said that um, he didn't think the method was credible. Remember, this is George Bush, he said. <laughs> that he didn't think this epidemiological standard procedure of epidemiologists was credible, which means that they had prepared an answer before he came out for this press conference. Mm -hmm. um, but he also said that this, I can't remember exactly what the number was, but something like between 30 and 50,000 people, according to uh, their estimates, had died in the conflict. So we're talking about a factor of 10 difference in those estimates. And this, to me, was was the first really big indication. Um, it was the first indication to me that that there was going to be a controversy, there was going to be a battle, so to speak, over these numbers. And there was, in fact. There was a very, very um, prolonged and, to some extent, bitter, among a small circle of people who paid attention to these things, but a very heated debate about how the numbers were arrived at, mm -hmm. how valid they were, and so on. And that, in fact, that debate goes on. There was a, there was a, re, there was a report from Brown University just the other day about the cost of the war on terror, and they were using, again, the smallest numbers mm -hmm. from Iraq by the count and so on, for reasons I don't quite understand. But in any case, um, the mortality figures and the controversy about the mortality figures and combined with other indicators, which I began to look at for this book I published, The Deaths of Others, uh, really told me that people simply did not want to come to terms with the scale of mayhem in these wars. And the question was, I mean, there was a lot of evidence for why, or that, that they did not want to come to terms terms with it, that there was a, a good deal of indifference or even hostility to to those who wanted to talk about it. When you say people did not want to come to terms with it, does that mean government officials or just the general American well, public? Well, everybody, really. I mean, if you look at um, certainly government officials, but they have a particular reason, which is they're culpable in a way that most people are not. Um, the news media... Um, Paid some attention to this. We, had, you know, when we released the the, the study again, the, the, the one that I was involved in, um, we you know we hired a professional firm to get the the word out, and he did a very good job. I mean, we worked with Fenton Communications, did a very good job, and we had something like uh, six front page stories in major newspapers next day. But then it faded rather quickly. Uh, except for this small number who are interested in these issues. Um, the news media, the New York Times, if you looked at the New York Times index over a period of time uh, and, um, you know, uh, search for words like civilian casualties or mortality or any number of search terms that you uh, might come up with stories about civilians being killed in Iraq, I think in 2006 there were something like 70 stories. Mm -hmm. 2006 was a very, very bloody year. It was the height of the mm 
resistance and, and uh, when the war was basically a civil war and out of control. Um, by contrast, uh, in 2011 or 2012, the um, situation in Syria, if you use the same search terms, um, you would come up with five times as many stories mm -hmm. about civilian casualties. And my feeling about that was that, and I think this is relevant to, to your question, um, is that at that point it was a war that the United States was not really involved in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therefore it was, there was more permissible mm -hmm. to talk about the human cost of war because the blame would not accrue to the United States. Um, but anyway, there are lots of other smaller bits of evidence about indifference. There were no charities to help the Iraqis. There was no effort to account for or adopt orphans. Um, you know, things that had happened during the Korean War and World War II didn't happen during Iraq. So I puzzled over this um, apparent indifference um, for a long time, and I, and I think that that really is the key question, is why is the American public uh, basically indifferent right. to the human cost of war? And I trace it back to the Vietnam War, to Korea um, and Afghanistan, and I think that, that in each case, the same symptoms, so to speak, of this indifference appeared. Um, and so the question is why, and is it, I don't think it's uniquely American either, I just haven't looked at other sides. I think you could say the same thing probably about the British and their imperial <laughs> wars as well. So Dr. Tamer, we'll come to um, you know, the reasons for this apparent indifference and lack of awareness uh, among the American public when it comes to um, U.S. interventions and the human cost of war. Um, in a 2012 opinion piece that you wrote for the New York Times, you wrote, ignoring the extent of civilian casualties and the damage they cause is a moral failing as well as a strategic blunder. We need to adopt reliable ways to measure the destruction our wars cause to break through the collective amnesia that has gripped us. So why is it strategically important for us to know what the civilian toll of war is? Well, the, pull, the, 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 the point I was making there really was um, a simple one, and that is, um, you know, General Tommy Franks, um, you know, the only American general to lose two wars, um, said that uh, we don't do body counts. You remember that famous or infamous um, assertion of his. Um, I actually think it's not the military's responsibility to do body counts, but he was making a, a, a more, you know, I think cynical statement. And somebody should do the body counts, mm -hmm. and they should do it in part to inform the military of what is actually going on on the ground. I mean, it's one of the most mind-boggling things to me um, that the military, the U.S. military, doesn't seem to want to know what the consequences of their warfighting uh, doctrine and actions uh, are. Um, you know, if you're a military commander, if you, you would want to know not only how many people were dying, but who was killing them and how they were being killed or how they were being displaced, and not just about mortality. How they were being displaced, how they were being injured, what was happening to them. But wouldn't they only be interested in their specific military goal, though, in that context? Like yeah, in terms that's of how right. many, uh, quote unquote, terrorists were being killed, or how many militia members were being killed, you know, from the other side, rather than, I mean, isn't it inconvenient for them to sort of learn more about what the civilian body count is? Well, this is, again, one of the puzzles of this kind of work, is that um, why doesn't the military want to know more? Mm -hmm. um, you may have seen this article that was published almost a year ago in the New York Times Magazine by Azmat Khan and Anand mm -hmm. Gopal um, about Mosul and the uh, they had done this very, it's quite an incredible um, 
piece of work, actually. Uh, they went to Mosul and looked at a, na a single neighborhood, basically, a large neighborhood, to count the casualties um, of, a New York, of, a, of, a, of a, an American bombing run over a period of days, I think, um, and compare it to how the U.S. military accounted for casualties from that period. Because the U.S. military does publish <coughs> some statistics mm -hmm. Of, and they have, particularly in this war against ISIS, um, they did so much less during the 2003-2011 um, occupation of Iraq. Uh, but what Azmat and um, Anand found was that they had underestimated the number of deaths by a factor of 31. It was, the number of deaths was 31 <laughs> times higher than what they claimed was the right number. And this is an astonishing number, I must say, for all the work that I've done on this, which I never did on the ground work like that. I just, working with these household surveys, um, I never really would have thought that the discrepancy would be that high. But that's what they found in this one case, and I think that, you, you know, it's hard to say that represents, you know, the, the entirety of military operations in the region, but it's indicative of what happens. In the military, I have found, uh, I had a chapter in my book on, on casualties on atrocities, because atrocities, um, which uh, occur in every war, of course, and can be committed by any side, but in the case of the United States, um, Milai and, and um, Haditha and other situations where civilians clearly had been wantonly killed by American soldiers, I thought deserves special attention because they indicated uh, several things about, about the military's approach, the public's reaction, that I thought were representative, really, of, of the larger phenomenon of war itself. It's kind of a microcosm of, of the problem of civilian deaths uh, in wartime. And what, one thing that, that I noticed uh, was that the public tended to be, uh, first of all, the military would lie about the atrocity, just out and out misrepresent completely or, you know, cover it up in some way, which had happened with Milan and it happened to uh, the, Korea, the Korean equivalent was something called no gunnery, which really wasn't discovered for many, many years after the war. It wasn't uncovered, I should say, by journalists. Um, and, and then Haditha in Iraq, uh, the scale of these is quite different. Of course, Milai, there were 400 civilians that were murdered. Haditha, there were 24. No gun re I'm not remembering the number, but it was more like 100. Um, the military denies that it ever happened. Then some enterprising journalist usually uncovers information, and the military lies about what happened again, but they have to acknowledge that something happened. Um, the public at that point, the first revelation is, is abhorred by what happened. There was a tremendous reaction when Seymour Hirsch published his articles about me live. And then there's a very interesting, sad uh, follow-up to that, and that is that the public begins to rally around the soldiers. Mm -hmm. And they begin to rally around the soldiers in part because for, for sort of two different, very different reasons. One is that they realize that the military and politicians are lying and they, do, and they think that the soldiers are being victimized mm -hmm. by their higher-ups, or they rally around the soldiers because they think the journalists and peace activists and others 
are victimizing the soldiers, and so they rallied around the soldiers. And it's really quite remarkable if you would look at the history of Milan, particularly because of much bigger controversy than the other two examples. I mean, it's astounding what happened. Um, by the time uh, Lieutenant Calley was um, being prosecuted, finally forced to be prosecuted by the military, um, a, a, but a majority of the American public were supporting him. Uh, people like Jimmy Carter embraced him. Uh, who was governor of Georgia, that he was from Georgia, Calais was from Georgia. Uh, there was a song written about Calais uh, that was very popular. Uh, Nixon, who was president, uh, defended him. Um, this guy murdered 400 Vietnamese civilians. There's no question about the facts of the case. He murdered 400 civilians. His sentence was two years of house arrest. And you distinguish between an atrocity and a military campaign that results in civilian casualty. And an atrocity is one where there is a deliberate killing of civilians, right? Is that how you would distinguish the two? Yes. Well, uh, circumstantial to some extent. I mean, it's not that that they set out to, each case was different um, of those three. Um, no Gunnery was more of a, a more classic example of a soldiers sort of panicking in a situation where they claimed that they could not distinguish civilians from, from fighters. Um, but, um, the, the the way that it was carried out suggested it was it was a bit more premeditated than that. Yeah. And so, um, since you wrote this op-ed uh, six years ago, um, you know you've mentioned one way of measuring the impact, the human in, uh, cost of uh, these interventions, is a household survey that you and the epidemiologist at uh, Johns Hopkins did. Has there been other ways now uh, from the government side to you know measure more accurately what's going on? Well, there could be methods brought to bear. There haven't been, really. Um, so the military uses after-action reports, is what they're called, typically. That is that um, if you're the commander of a unit of some kind that was engaged in hostile fire and you believe some civilians were hurt or killed, you report that in a report about what happened. And those could be then... Um, you know, uh, analyzed by others, and, and, and some numbers come up. And the WikiLeaks, I don't know if you remember, but the WikiLeaks had, re had released some of these after-action reports, oh, when was it, about four years ago, um, about Iraq. And the number of casualties that were listed in those after-action reports amounted to something like 70,000, so this was the new number. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's only the number that people reported and the number of, and that Americans saw. We're not talking about uh, civilian, in the, in the Lancet studies, we're not talking about just civilians that Americans killed. It's mm -hmm. all Iraqis by any means. Uh, so, um, it's a very inadequate method, is after action reports. Um, you know, there are other things you could do. You could do household surveys that were um, um, rigorously done. Um, and um, I think for the most part, the ones that were done were, were reasonably rigorous given the, the difficulty. I mean, these researchers put their lives on the line to get some of these numbers, there's a very fraught situation, especially the first ones that were done in 2004, 2006, because there's an active civil war going on. Um, so, in fact, some there were some researchers who were killed, not the ones who were doing our survey, but another survey. Um, so it's, it's very, very fraught. Uh, I think that there are other ways of getting some information about the human cost of war um, that are not necessarily uh, about mortality, but about things like um, displacement and, and uh, condition of infrastructure, education, 
other things. Uh, you can do crowdsourcing, you can do satellite imagery uh, to some extent. Um, there are other techniques that can be brought to bear in it if we really experimented with this and, and use our technological capability. I'm sure that we could get uh, a better handle on it. It's something that I think would be really important to do, not least because, again, um, you know, there's a responsibility the government certainly has um, to know what, in fact, are, you know, the consequences of war that we're conducting uh, for all kinds of reasons. I mean, it's not just, you know, our concern here is mostly a moral concern, I think, but um, you have, for example, I mentioned military efficacy, which I don't care about that much, but, but I do care about what happens to society after the war is over. And reconstruction, um, rehabilitation, uh, trying to do things that will help the society not simply dissolve into, uh, into factions, as in fact happened after we left Iraq. And the, the growth of ISIS is a, is a dramatic example of what happens as a result of the destructiveness of war. Well, if we had better information about what that destruction had been, with human destruction and physical, you know, infrastructure type destruction, um, conceivably we could rebuild and help rebuild and rehabilitate a society much more, uh, much more effectively. Right, and what happens abroad has direct implications for us here at home as well, right? Because those who attack us here um, are perhaps those who feel that somehow as US citizens we are responsible for what some of the, uh, the things that our government does in our name that we are directly responsible for that and so we are fair game in terms of yeah. being targeted in that respect. Well, I think that the, the cost, the, the reputational cost of the United States have been colossal and we, it's another thing we don't like to acknowledge. It was just an article, I think, in Associated Press reported a very good piece on Afghanistan, uh, which of course has been basically ignored for years. Uh, and the resentment among Afghans toward the United States is just sky high. Um, they believe, not uh, mistakenly, that um, very little progress has actually been made in the country over these what is it, 17 years now, and a lot of people have died in lung construction, uh, destruction. Um, now a great deal of corruption. The Taliban is coming back. Uh, half the country is under Taliban control, you know. Um, and they blame the Americans. If you looked at, there was a fair amount of polling in Iraq during the war, just standard polling of, of you know, sort of getting opinions about the war and about their their daily lives and so on, and the, and the amount of blame on the United States was just extraordinary. Outside the Kurdish areas, which were relatively peaceful um, in the north, uh, in the Arab part of Iraq, which is 20 million people, 25 million people, um, it was like 80, 90 percent of them were blaming the United States uh, for everything. Mm -hmm. It had happened to them, all the dislocation and the impoverishment, you know, loss of livelihoods, um, uh, destruction of, you know, sewage systems, water systems, schools, things that, um, you know, we think about a lot of, in terms of life and death, but it's there's a lot of other things that happened during the war which are horrible too. And um, we have been blamed for that, and I think again, for the most part, correctly. Uh, how that actually plays out over time is there's a, you know, what are the long-term consequences that are kind of hard to measure, but there's no question that the short-term uh, in-country attitudes are very, very negative toward the U.S. And uh, sort of coming back to our sort of lack of awareness around these issues, um, you've in your writings have identified the frontier myth narrative as another possible explanation um, for the American public's lack of concern and sort of indifference around this. Could you describe what that is? Well, the, um, the myth of the frontier is something that um, 
uh, has been very extensively documented by a cultural historian named Richard Slotkin. And Slotkin taught at Will, uh, Wesleyan for many years. He just retired a couple of years ago. He wrote a three-volume work on the myth of the frontier. It's about uh, 2,000 pages long, but it is remarkable, and I recommend it if you, uh, if you have the, the fortitude to read it. Um, using a lot of original sources, and he basically said, you know, every country has a national narrative, um, you know, about itself. It's a mix of myth and legend and, you know, selected events and, and so on. And it's meant to, you know, valorize people and so on, um, tell a story that is, um, uh, sort of defines what a nation is, its characteristics. And he contends, I think, very convincingly that ours is about the frontier. And the frontier uh, really started here um, in East Hampton. No, I'm a little bit further east. Um, started with the Puritans and their whole sort of um, uh, view was that they were going to tame the wilderness. It was called an errand to the wilderness. And it was a divinely sanctioned mission to um, subdue the savage uh, and reap the bounty of the wilderness. And this would um, this was the frontier. And the frontier, in fact, just kept moving west as, in fact, those things happen. Of course, the savages, the indigenous people, and um, many, many uh, lives were lost along the way. Um, Slotkin claims that, that violence was itself a, a kind of um, cherished value of this. It was viewed as being regenerative. Um, it's a slightly controversial um, assertion, but a very interesting one. But in any case, uh, when the North American continent was um, settled, more or less, by white European um, people, like us, uh, some company excluded. Um, the uh, uh, people like Woodrow Wilson, Theodore Roosevelt, and others viewed the world then as the next frontier for the United States. And the Philippines War was actually in, in, in 1898 uh, on through uh, the first few years of the 20th century. I almost said this century, <laughs> um, was the first um, sort of exponent of that view. Their real goal was China more than anything else. But um, we've carried this idea of the frontier that, that places like the Middle East, like Iraq and Iran and, and um, uh, Vietnam, uh, to extend it further to, toward the China uh, bit, um, that this was our frontier. This was a wilderness. There were savages who were living there. There was a bounty to be gained uh, by going there. And this expansionist view has really been at the root of a lot of American um, presence in the world and American globalism right from the beginning. And things like Manifest Destiny and uh, American Exceptionalism and so on are really subsets of this, of this frontier myth. And the way it justifies this kind of, mm -hmm. of uh, military intervention and, and expansion is that we have this attitude, and I think if you scratch the surface, a lot of Americans feel this way, that the world is our oyster. I mean, we, we go, we civilize, quote unquote, mm -hmm. uh, and we get rewarded for it. I mean, you could see this with, you know, Trump is a pretty crude, uh, um, uh, messenger, I guess I'd say, of, of this view. But, you know, he talked about during the 2016 campaign, he complained that the war in Iraq was a failure because we didn't keep the oil. Remember he was talking about that? We should have kept the oil. That was that was the whole purpose of going there. Well, that's sort of, you know, again, very crude, but nevertheless uh, kind of a fulfillment of that, of that um, long, you know, now 400-year uh, tradition, if you will. And as you're indicating, so it's not just 
this mindset that exists at the government and the policy level, but it is sort of seeps down into the public as well. Like that yeah, it's a very culty. It's a cultural set of values, really, and it and it, it it's in lots of institutions and a lot, a lot of literature. Slotkin talks a great deal about not only literature but movies. Mm -hmm. um, things like if you've ever seen the great John Ford. Uh, movie The Searchers with John Wayne, a really quite a remarkable film, I must say. Um, it's all about a captivity narrative, which is part of this whole shtick, is that, you know, a white woman being cap captured by mm -hmm. uh, Indians and, and um, you know, all kinds of mayhem ensues. And, and, and this was one of the standard tropes of colonial America, the, the biggest, the, the longest uh, uh, the bestseller that was a bestseller for the longest period of time in American history was about the captivity of a woman in the 18th century mm -hmm. that she wrote her own testament to this and so that's kind of a, uh, a part of this uh, a frontier myth you remember in Iraq um, there was a captivity narrative. A woman, a young, uh, I think she was a sergeant in the yeah. army, Jessica Lynch. Yes. You remember that story? And there was all kinds of mythologizing around the story. Frank Rich did a very good job of uh, deconstructing this. Uh, but it was, exact, it was like a script out of the 18th century. She was captured by the savages you know, this fair young maiden captured by the savages and then rescued by, you know, some special forces. I mean, it was really, it was out of Hollywood. Uh, turned out none of the, those particulars was accurate. Um, but we keep replaying this cowboys and Indians kind of mentality uh, of, um, of foreign adventures. And I think that that's partly done um, to cover for what's, you know, essentially a racist attitude toward these people. I mean, mm -hmm. it's more the racism that's a problem than the frontier myth per se. It's, it's the subduing of the savages, and the savages are always brown people. Um, and uh, it just, it sort of <laughs> valorizes this, uh, what is essentially acts of um, aggression and murder in many cases. Sure, so I just wanted to shift gears just a little bit and just briefly, um, only because uh, you have written extensively on immigration as well. And um, currently there's a migrant caravan moving towards uh, the American border uh, from Central America. And do you see migration or forced migration as one of the human costs associated with repeated US interventions? Well, certainly the Central Americans who are coming um, are coming in part because of the Central American wars that we promoted in the 1980s, particularly promoted meaning backed one side or the other with a lot of with a lot of weapons um, and supporting regimes that are repressive, as in Honduras, El Salvador, particularly. Um, then there's another side to it, which is gang violence that comes out of, you know, drug consumption, drug trafficking. Um, the, I, I think the, the, the most striking uh, thing relevant to this conversation is um, that we, you know, we have again a, um, a phenomenon in which uh, there's real human suffering that is, to some extent, um, some significant extent, the, the, the consequence of U.S. policy in the region, uh, whether having to do with drugs or world war, repression, um, neoliberal policies which have destroyed uh, subsistence farming, particularly in Mexico. If you look at the, just as, a, as an aside here, if you look at the number of Mexicans who crossed the border illegally, and, um, it shoots up after NAFTA. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. was signed. I mean, just like this, mm -hmm. a spec. And the reason for that is that NAFTA destroyed basically a lot of subsistence corn farming, particularly um, because it gave tremendous uh, advantages to mm -hmm. large-scale corporate farms in the United States to um, to export to Mexico. Mm -hmm. It's a staple of Mexican diets and, and uh, um, so on and so forth. So, you know, neoliberal economic policies, which are not mindful at all of those kinds of effects. Uh, I don't think they intentionally set mm -hmm. out to do that, but that's the effect. Uh, and now that's happening, that's happening in Central America as well, which has its own free trade agreement in the United States and other countries too. Uh, plus the drugs, plus repression, and so on. And so we have these policies that affect large numbers of people who really become desperate. They have nothing to lose by trying to migrate. Um, and yet we, uh, uh, the, the discourse in this country is about uh, blaming them for coming here. And, and it's very similar it's not exactly the same, but it's very similar to what we saw during the Iraq War with people like, I remember there was a, one of these uh, editorials that, uh, what's his name, Fox uh, News commentator, uh, not a news commentator, uh, had his own show, the guy who O'Reilly. O'Reilly, oh, yes. <laughs> um, he had this long spiel about how, um, you know, as the war really turned sour, and clearly people were turning against it, he said, well, we've given the Iraqis every chance. You know, we've given them every chance to seize their freedom and to make themselves a good country, and look what they've done with it now. I mean, it's almost the same thing, right? With these Central Americans coming, they're the ones who are being, you know, um, not, not even in the Trump version of this, you know, which is that they're all bad guys, but even in more mild uh, renditions of how, the, how they're described as being, um, you know, sort of uh, not worthy right. in some sense. Um, and so you, you see this often in, um, in anything having to do with Latin America, for one thing. Mm -hmm which, of course, we've been beating up on for a long, long time. But um, uh, it, it's, again, sort of part of the, this frontier mentality that, you know, we can, we can go to these countries and take what we feel we, we want out of them, whether resources or labor or whatever, um, but God forbid that they should stand up for their own rights or... Uh, even just uh, in, in the most desperate circumstances, try to get a, a, a foothold here. Um, in, in that sense, it's quite similar. And when it comes to blaming them, do you think it's there is a, a people see the link between our interventions there and then the forced migration that happens as a result of it, or they don't see that link at all? And it's you know they're uh, just seeing a whole bunch of people trying to get to the American border and. No, I, I don't think there's much connection that's made. I mean, a, a little bit, and I think a little bit more and more over over the last um, couple of years, as you know, as Trump has demonized them more and more, the, some people on the left or the, the sort of moderate liberals have been more mindful of the reasons people migrate. Um, the fact is that. Um, is that illegal immigration, labor migration, is a system. It's a system that is not exactly intentional. It's not designed. It's not, um, you know, uh, um, created in some back room. But it evolves as a system all over the world, really, not just here. It's also Europe has the same, some of the same issues. Um, a system of labor exploitation that many, many American businesses are perfectly happy to participate in. They keep wages low, 
Um, you know, there's competition for jobs. Uh, we can pay people who come over from from Central America and Mexico, you know, very, very low wages. Mm -hmm. They can never complain. Uh, they don't keep their, um, you know, they don't get benefits. They don't, um, they have to work long hours and so on and so forth. Um, so it benefits, you know, you know, this is a classic case of who benefits, you know, qui bono. And for the longest time, um, you know, as ranchers, uh, others in the agricultural sector, but increasingly uh, in industry as well, meat packing, things like that, really difficult or horrible jobs. Um, and, you know, the 11 million people just didn't show up all of a sudden. And um, they, they were sort of coaxed into coming or, or um, uh, certainly given jobs when they got here because it benefited people right. to do that. So I think it's important to view not only the reasons why people migrate as being at least in part a consequence of U.S. policy. It's also a consequence of corrupt governments in those regions uh, that won't provide for their people. Um, but also there is a system of migration that exists. Mm -hmm. Some of it's legal, a lot of it is not. So uh, we're coming to the end of this first part of the program, but I just wanted to sort of end with, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, according to the uh, Brown University's Cost of War project, uh, right now we're militarily involved in 76 different countries where we're carrying out counterterrorism operations. What can we as American citizens do to, one, hold our government more accountable for the kinds of operations that are happening and the civilian cost uh, that happens as a result of it. Well, I think that I think that the key word is accountability, and I, and I think you have, you know, in, in someone like Jim McGovern, you have somebody who could be very important in demanding some accountability from Congress. I had proposed in a in a, a piece I did for Foreign Affairs um, a. Uh, what I call a conflict assessment um, that we should do for every time that we're involved um, in a conflict. And that is to do in real time, while conflict is going on, try to measure demand that the military or some third, probably some third party because military is so uh, biased basically as any institution would be, um, get the general accounting office or some other government agency to um, do an assessment of what the costs, the real costs of intervention are. Uh, and again, not just mortality or the dollar costs, but things like what's happening with the, with the youth in that country, the education, disease, um, health care, etc. Um, and that this would, it's not to say that this kind of accounting um, is necessarily going to change the course of that conflict, but it keeps, you know, institutionalizes the need for accountability. We have none now, basically. There's no accountability. There's never been a, a sustained, maybe never at all, but there hasn't been a sustained investigation of the Iraq war. And you know, we've actually been at war in Iraq since 1991. Between sanctions and, and hot war, we have been in Iraq for 26 years. We've been in Afghanistan for 17 years. And there's no accountability for how we got there, or what's going on, what's happening to uh, the, the, the local populations. So any mechanism, mm -hmm. and I think it should be sort of a formal mechanism, like a conflict assessment, otherwise it becomes just uh, something that can be done once and then discarded, um, is, is one way to get at it. And, and it also draws the media's attention a little bit to it. Um, but I think that part of it is just, from, from a, sort of a citizen activism point of view, is doing the same things you do all the time. That's, you know, you're writing your congressperson, you're, uh, you know, sending letters to, to 
the networks and, and cable news organizations and so on and saying, you know, what's going on with this? Right. But as citizens, should we be um, calling for more accurate conflict assessments or should we be advocating for less intervention mm -hmm. altogether? Well, th uh, certainly the, the idea yes. that we're involved in the 70 some uh, <laughs> conflicts around the world or interventions is pretty appalling. And I think it, but I think the two sides are the same coin. I mean, on the one hand, I'm not a pacifist, and I think that there is a rule, a global rule for the U.S. military. It's a whole different discussion, but I think that there is, um, uh, there are cases where uh, the judicious, legal use of military power is a good thing. Um, but um, the problem is that there's so few institutional constraints on the military. Um, and really, the civilian leadership is much more problematic than the military leadership, I must say. Um, but, um, you know, the whole idea is just to get accountability up on both counts. Why are we in this place and what's going on? It's basically two sides of the same coin. Thank you so much, Dr. Terman. Uh, this sort of concludes the first part of our program, and yeah. I'll now turn it over to Jenny McKenna from Corona Center to moderate the second part. Hi, I'm on the board at the Corona Center. I'm here representing us and our um, our our chairperson, our, our CEO, is in Nigeria, and she would love to be here tonight, but she's glad to be there. So um, the next part of this is driven in, pa in part by the Karuna Center's way of being in the world, which is we believe in bringing people together to talk to each other. The, the short description of our mission is we build bridges to create sustainable peace. There's another board member here who'll check me on that. Um, and so we think about the process of building bridges as people talking to each other. So at this moment in our presentations, we nearly always have asked people to turn to the people around them or to stand up and go talk to somebody you've never talked about. And the thing I would like you to think about today is what particularly has caught your ear tonight in what you've heard? Or if you don't like that, another idea is what did you bring with you tonight that made you come out on this freezing cold, dark night? <laughs> to hear about this very difficult material. So talk away and um, in threes and fours, and we'll interrupt you in about 10 minutes or so to have you wind down, and then we'll come back and actually ask um, questions. Um, to the con <laughs> conflict in Yemen um, and the U.S. U.S. role in that, and civ civilian casualties within that, and the um, political implications um, of our arms deals with Saudi Arabia um, in the context of the more human situation on the ground. Since we don't have a long mic, I'm going to ask you to sort of repeat the, the okay, question. Okay. Well, the question so that it goes on the tape. about Yemen and, and U.S. culpability. Um, you know, the origins of the, of the U.S. Uh, support for the Saudi war against Yemen uh, was paradoxically the, the Iran uh, nuclear deal. That is, uh, Obama and John Kerry, uh, apparently, they've never quite copped to this, but it seems pretty apparent that uh, they felt they had to buy off the Saudi uh, cooperation, or quiescence anyway, on um, on the Iran deal uh, by supporting the, the war in Yemen, which uh, three years ago or so when they started was depicted as a 
in part as a um, a proxy war with Iran. That is, Iran was supporting the Houthis and a uh, very complicated kind of leadership struggle. Um, the actual amount that Iran was supporting the Houthis is very much in dispute, however. Um, uh, seem to be very tangential and there's a different form of Shiism the two practice and, and so on. I'm not completely familiar with the details. Uh, but in any case, we, the United States, did begin to support the Saudis with armaments uh, and refueling, which is very crucial for their, uh, for their bombs. Um, you know, time and again, uh, international officials of humanitarian agencies have described the Yemen situation as really close to being catastrophic. Uh, it is, of course, there have been a lot of casualties already. Numbers are in dispute, but it's in the thousands. A lot of children um, have died from malnutrition and bombing. Um, and the, the it's bad enough as it is, but they seem to be on the brink, constantly on the brink of some major uh, catastrophe like famine and disease. Um, you know, it's one of those conflicts which basically just escaped notice for the longest time. Uh, and I know that a lot of activists um, on Middle East issues have been complaining about that very thing. Is that the American public is not paying attention, news media not paying attention, policy people not talking about it. Um, which is partially true. I mean, I have a slightly uh, skewed perspective because I work in that field, and so I do notice that there's a lot who was being said about it, but I think for, the, for most Americans, it was very easy not to notice what was going on. Um, less so now because of the killing of the journalist Khashoggi, whose name is pronounced some other way, and I never really get it right, so I'll just pronounce it like a good old Midwestern American. Um, and, you know, it's, it is, again, it's sort of a paradox that it took that, you know, awful thing uh, to draw attention to something else, and that is to this um, rampage of Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, uh, in the whole region. It's not just... Yemen, although that's the worst example, but of course the crack they've been war with Qatar and have been supporting Al Qaeda types in Syria and all kinds of things. Saudis have been really bad actors for a long time. Actually, precedes uh, precedes uh, Bin Salman. So um, finally, I think, oddly, uh, the the Khashoggi murder has brought together. Some members of the Republican Party, I think uh, uh, Rand Paul just made a statement, I think today, in fact, about how this could create some bipartisan action um, of sanctions on the Saudis. Um, and of course, a number of Democrats have been saying things similarly. So um, perhaps we're finally getting our hands around this. It's taken a long time. It's been going on for quite a long time. And of course, it's not over yet. I mean, it's not just because we are talking about sanctions doesn't mean that the war will stop. They did say the other day that um, there was some sort of announcement the United States would stop refueling Saudi bombers. And if that is, in fact, correct, it's going to make it difficult for them to carry out this kind of extensive bombing that they have been doing. But it doesn't mean that they can't. Uh, pursue the war uh, at all. So we'll just have to, we'll have to see. But it's a slight glimmer of hope here that things may turn around. Anyone else? Yes. You commented on the fact that there have been no depression investigations. You commented on the fact that there have been no congressional investigations into the war in Iraq or Afghanistan, no accountability. My recollection is that both constitutionally and historically, not always to the extent we might wish, the Congress has, at least during or after wars, 
World War I, World War II, Vietnam. Usually the Senate has undertaken committee investigations of the war. Why has that apparently stopped? And since the Senate still remains in the control of Republicans, is, this, is it likely to restart anytime soon? Well, you know, you have to remember, uh, we're both of an age to remember the Fulbright hearings, which came rather late in the Vietnam, during the Vietnam War. People forget this, but it, Fulbright hearings came, I can't remember the exact year, but it was like 1972, something like that, I think. Um, and they were quite controversial. He took a lot of heat. William Fulbright was a senator from Arkansas, if you can believe that. Uh, quite um, quite uh, an interesting character. Um, conducted fairly, he was chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and conducted a very extensive hearings. I think it came on the heels of the release of the Pentagon Papers. So there was kind of a hunger for understanding how we could have gotten into this this mess <coughs> as it was described at the time. Um, it's interesting, I mean, you make a very valid point, which is, uh, you know, why hasn't there been that kind of hunger around the Iraq War, for example, which um, did not involve the same number of casualties to American soldiers as did Vietnam. Uh, it wasn't as large a war. There were 130 or 40,000 soldiers um, deployed in Iraq at its peak. Half a million in Vietnam went on a lot longer. Did not have the same benefits of a medical uh, evacuation techniques to save people's lives, soldiers' lives, um, in Vietnam, so the mortality rate was higher. But in any case, uh, still, Iraq was a, you know, a major blow to, um, to our sense of uh, our mission in the world, I suppose. And so it's a mystery to me why this has not been investigated. I think it partly do, uh, if you look at the sequence of who is in charge of the Senate in this period, um, Bush was defeated, you know, Bush lost the Senate majority in 2006. The Republicans lost the majority in Congress in 2006. But Democrats only kept it for four, uh, for six years, right, seven years, something like eight years. And I think that the, the party leadership, especially when Obama became president, was, um, did not want to engage in what they thought were going to be act, acts of recrimination. I mean, this was sort of, you know, I admire Barack Obama greatly, but his, um, his personality of, which is mostly admirable of conciliatory, you know, conciliatory attitude toward conflict. Uh, uh, sometimes it just doesn't work very well in American government. Sometimes you have to be a little tougher, a little meaner than he is. He's just not mean enough. And I think Harry Reid really wasn't sort of mean enough either. Uh, it's the wrong way of putting it, but you know what I mean. That they needed to really hold Bush and Cheney accountable. It's like, you know, the torture stuff. I mean, why weren't they prosecuted for torture? They acknowledged that they were torturing people. Um, and I think it was just uh, uh, Obama's um, desire to just put it all behind us and look forward to, you know, what at that time was an enormous economic crisis in this country. So, that's the only explanation I can think of for not doing it over Iraq. Afghanistan has been much more of a slow burn, you know. In other words, we got into Afghanistan. There wasn't much objection to going into Afghanistan. You know, it was a, a posse, right, to go after the bad guy. 
and uh, it grew into a much larger conflict, nation building all. But it was very gradual, and for a number of years, actually, it was going pretty well as these things go. I mean, there was a lot of problems with a lot of corruption, and a lot of wasted energy and lives and so on, but it was, it was sort of low level and not getting that much attention. Another question? Hi, Eva. Mm -hmm. um, when you talk about doing conflict assessments or impact assessments, how, how broad is our scope? I mean, it seems like you could assume that one community is impacted, but it could, you could probably go further and further and further. So how broad would you suggest to go? Well, um, I think one question is, um, Sort of what triggers a, an assessment? You know, what 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 level of of intervention? What what level of warfare uh, would actually trigger that kind of assessment? And that's you know that's sort of up for grabs. You could describe it a lot of different ways. A lot of special operations things going on in the world that are very quiet and don't get any attention at all. You know, when those Marines were killed in Niger. Mm -hmm. You know, a couple of years ago, was it? <clears throat> Hardly anybody knew that we were hand operations in that year. You know, we have, a, we, we have um, an African command now, which is much more active than it was, or there wasn't even an African command 10 years ago, I don't think. I can't quite remember the sequence. But So, you know, the practicality of doing an assessment on something like that would be very would be very low, but certainly when we're openly committing troops uh, to an active conflict or starting a conflict as we did in Iraq, um, that should that should trigger um, a mechanism to begin to look at uh, what I, I think about ten indicators um, has to do with well. The most obvious one's mortality and displacement, but what's happening with livelihoods, what's happening with young people and education, uh, what's happening with infrastructure, which is water and sewage and, and electricity, um, and so on. And f for the most part, these things can be measured uh, remotely. You don't have to be there in the country to figure out what's going on. You can do things like for education, for example, you could measure quite a bit just with satellite photography. I mean, there's commercial satellite photography that, you know, can, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, basically, you know, read the lapel in your jacket now. So you can get a lot of information remotely, you don't need to cooperation with local governments, but you also get information from local governments in, in many cases. So I think about 10 indicators would, would go a, a long way toward giving you a picture of what's happening, and then you watch what happens over time. And that's a really important piece of it, is that, you know, what, what exists in, in year one, as far as education, say, is concerned, how many kids are going to school basically. Uh, and what's happening in year four, if you see a marked decline in how many kids are going to school, pretty easy to measure. You know that there's something really chronically wrong um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to rebound against that society. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It's not really a question, but when we're speaking, um, this man mentioned the impact of not having a draft, and I think that's so critical in terms of the indifference of the public to, to what goes on internationally. Um, I just think it's, it's probably number one of why we don't pay attention. Yeah, yes and no. I think there was, there was a draft during the Korean War, wasn't there? Yes. yes. During the Korean yeah. War, yes. There was a draft then, and it didn't seem to matter. In terms of public perceptions of, or public demand for an end to the war. I mean, there was a public demand, but it came pretty late in, it was a very, very bloody 
Vietnam. It's called the Forgotten Vietnam. War, and it was forgotten in part because uh, indifference and in her oh, right. yeah. War II, too. And it dragged on as long as Vietnam eventually dragged on. Would well, actually, Korean War was just three years long. Right. What I mean, if it had dragged on longer, oh, yeah. the yeah, might yeah. have mobilized. It may have changed, yes, have changed. it's true. It was a different time, though, you know. So uh, I'll tell you the question before I tell, <laughs> ask it, which is just to have you just comment on a, something I believe, which is that uh, you talked about accountability, and I shared this with my group, is that I don't believe there's ever going to be any real accountability until we, as a nation, can be held accountable for how our nation was founded, for the uh, racist invasion and slaughter of people followed by the racist slaughter of Africans, mm -hmm. followed by everything that came after it, manifest destiny and helping our poor brown neighbors in the Philippines and overthrowing governments all over the world and on and on and on and, and continuing with today's war on black men and on poor people. And until, I, I believe, until we can be held accountable for that, nothing's gonna really change. We can have accountability projects that will make a war accountable or some CIA action accountable. We've not, we've not even had it, been accountable for what we did in Iraq, in uh, Iran in the 50s. And so for me, we're talking about specific little incidents as it goes along in this war and that war, but to me it started with atrocities and we've never owned up to it. I just, I just wondered your comments on that. Well, I, I don't disagree. I, I think um, there have been changes, um, very gradual ones, in how we uh, teach in schools, in some schools anyway, um, the um, uh, what happened to indigenous people in this country. I think uh, in significant measure due to the revisionist historians like Howard Zinn, who's my old friend. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, one of the really uh, upsetting things about the election last, uh, last week <coughs> was disenfranchising um, the tribes in North Dakota. Yeah. I mean, and the, you know, again, sort of, it was just another sidebar to other stories. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the whole thing about voter suppression, all of which is aimed at, you know, brown people, brown people. more or less, um, uh, in Florida and Georgia particularly, but all, I mean, I think, you know, uh, Ari Berman, who writes mm -hmm. uh, about this very extensively and very well, I think he's now with Mother Jones, um, said that there are voter suppression efforts in 31 states. I mean, it's just astounding. I mean, the, the worst of it we're seeing in Georgia, and Florida, and North Dakota, but it's happening much more broadly. And I, I think, you know, um, that's just an indication of what you just said, is it's still very much, these things are still very much alive. Um, just one other comment about that, and that is uh, during the, um, the, the genocides in, in Bosnia in the early 1990s, um, I felt, and I, I know somebody else did write a piece about this, which I thought was good, I'm not going to remember who it was, but um, we had a hard time coming to terms with the whole idea of ethnic cleansing. Because that's what we did in this country ourselves. Yes. Right. It's a very, it's you know, it's it's remarkably hidden um, from view. In part because it's all felt to now to be so distant from us. But we, we, we do acknowledge and and commemorate things like the end of the First World War, or Kristallnacht, both of which just were commemorated this week, 
And that's a long time ago, you know. Wounded Knee was only about a couple decades before that, mm -hmm. you know, before the end of this First World War. So, um, you know, historical memory is is uh, is a politicized thing too. It's not. Uh, <coughs> sure. And um, I don't know if you've been to the Museum of the American Indian. I think it's called in Washington. It's the most anodyne. Mm -hmm thing you can imagine. I mean, it just doesn't even really acknowledge anything close to what happened in this country. Mm -hmm. You start with that. That's a great <laughs> note. <laughs>